get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs like the founders of RX Bars, P90X, Atari, and many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country, including many in the e-commerce industry. And Rise25 hosted events this past year in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, Las Vegas, and probably others I'm missing. Uh, so if you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate, to get your business to the next level, contact us, see where our next event is going to be at rise25.com. I'm going to intro you to today's guest, Dylan. Dylan, you were actually at one of our uh, events in San Diego. Yeah. It, happened. it was fantastic um, and uh, economically fruitful. That is, you know, <laughs> buy your pillars of acquisition, conversion, retention. We'll get into that. That's important to you. So I'm glad. I'm glad you loved it. It was great to have you there and contribute. Um, so today we have Dylan Whitman, co-founder of BDXL. Full name is Brand Value Accelerator. They're one of the fastest growing Shopify focused agencies in the world. Acquisition plus conversion plus retention is are there three pillars for their e-commerce philosophy? So when you when you go to their site, you actually see that front and center. And when I saw that, Dylan, I was like, "This is my kind of company." Okay. Yeah. They provide disruptive e-commerce strategy and implementation, and they've served high-growth brands including Movement Watches, Red Bull, Mizzet Maine, Barkthins, and many, many more. Uh, BVXL is headquartered in San Diego, California with offices in New York, Los Angeles, Columbus, Mexico, and Melbourne, Australia. Correct. Dylan, thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited. We're going to dig in. We'll get into the weeds of e-commerce, but I, I want people to get to know you a little bit. Um, and so I want to talk about the Navy. But okay. before we talk about the Navy, I have to ask, just get it out of the way, your favorite Shopify apps. You're probably the go-to person. You're probably implementing them, using them, installing sure. them. Tell me about what, what are your favorite Shopify apps and most used? Um, so um, favorite Shopify apps, I think one of them would be Flow.io. Mm -hmm. And Flow.io is a really killer platform that was started by um, some of the ex-co-founders of Guilt Group. And it allows for multi-currency purchasing mm. on the site which has been a really big pain point for Shopify, right? And one of the most, the reason that I say it's one of my favorite is because I, I see a lot of kind of trendy apps that pop up. You see Willio or you see, you know, this thing or that thing, and they kind of work for a little bit and become saturated. And then you got to move on to the next kind of trendy gimmick that's going to get your site going, right? Um, but I like things that, are, that provide actual value to the customer buying in your same localized currency, right? Yeah. Um, they and also kind of fulfill a pain point that people have. Fulfill a pain point versus being a gimmick to trick people into something. And yeah. when I bring that up is because I also like things that make, make money for the customer. You know, but the for BBXL, the um, mission statement is the relentless pursuit of profit for our clients. Love it, and yeah. That's because um, what I feel I've learned in the agency world is that no matter how great you think you are or no matter how great what you're doing is, if you're not making people money, you are going to get cut because this world is so uh, uh, competitive now. So getting back to that flow, I found it so fascinating because this year was the first time that we had one of our major clients, and I won't say who it is, but they did more than 50% of their revenue overseas through flow wow. for holiday season, right? And to me, I'm thinking to myself, if they had not installed that, they would not have got, number one, they help serve all those customers and get them excited about, you know, the brand and, and its yeah. localization. Number two is um, they were able to actually make a ton of extra money that they probably wouldn't have made. 
And, and that's so critical for growing brands now. Yeah. Um, so that's one. I'm going to give you this, Dylan. I think I'm going to give you this video, and you're gonna, this should be a separate blog post of sure. all your recommended Shopify apps. I don't know if you have a I looked at your blog. The, the recent ones didn't have this on there, but this is a great topic. So go on, flow.io. Um, let me tell you another thing that I think about when I think about apps. And I, I might think about it in a different way, take it with a grain of salt. You know, I have my own kind of, ways that I approach things, but a lot of people I see jump from apps. So let's talk about reviews, for instance, right? Yahoo is one of my favorite uh, apps for Shopify, and they're, they're obviously on other platforms as well, but here's the reason why. People complain about maybe the cost of Yahoo or things of that nature, right? But what they're not realizing is when they're when they're grabbing these kind of knockoff apps, like a stamp.io, which there's nothing wrong with, lots of people use it, I've heard really great reviews, but what, what people have to understand is that this world's getting so competitive and when they are focused on hopping between apps with limited features for just straight cost, they're not benefiting from the things that, you know, that I see Yachtmo doing, which is uh, from a review standpoint, really digging into data, really investing in the uh, feature set, really investing in the growth of the product, right? And so when I think about apps that I get excited about, it's people that are paving the way for the future of where things are going. Mm. People that are they're innovating. Them. They're not like kind of me too type of thing, but they're innovating. Um, that as a brand to be competitive, right? Because how can you be competitive if you're just doing the same bullshit that other people were doing and just jumping in and, and trying to pay cheaper? Like, pick the platforms. Another great one, Nosto. The guys are killers, and they're they are um, uh, really investing into their technology and helping themselves grow. And here's the other thing I love about both of those apps is I think they're both in line with where I think the future of commerce platforms are going and that is automated and predictive right you want the big challenge with retail in general previously is that you know it, it's this high fixed cost where you're investing all this money and you're going to create all these custom systems right i want platforms and apps that solve the problem for me that do it with minimal interaction and get it done predictably and i think that's where these apps are going so when i think about cool apps i look at nosto i look at Yacht, so I look at these guys that are really getting momentum and really investing into their product. Um, What's Nasto do? Nasto does uh, a, a lot of cool stuff around predictive merchandising hmm. and recommendations and things of that nature. Um, and the other thing I think is cool is these apps that really invest into integration, right? So how do you integrate Nasto, you know, with Yacht Post so that you know that if somebody left a review of five stars for X product, totally. you're 90% more likely to buy you know, Y product with a 5% discount or something to that effect, right? So cool apps that are predictive, investing in their technology, uh, highly integrated. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention my own new app, Retention Rocket. Oh, you have a new app. <laughs> How new is it? Uh, it's only in beta. I only have private beta customers on it right now. Okay. Um, so what's uh, it called? Retention? What's that? It's called Retention what? Retention rocket. Rocket. Yep. So it's a it, it's a predictive, uh, integrated retention platform that can work in conjunction with a lot of these things um, to raise revenue. So we're working with some killer clients, Fashion Nova, Pura Vita bracelets. A lot of the top guys on Shopify are already in our private beta. So that's a little uh, self self fulfilling. Talk about that for a second, though, because yep. this is interesting. Because I was doing the research, I'm thinking, if I were Dylan, I would be completely ADD. I work on all these sites. And I get yep. all these great ideas for because you solve pain points for customers and you see what their pain points are. And sometimes you probably have ideas on software or apps or a, biz, a whole other business. Like I, I couldn't do what you do for that reason. But so I was thinking when I was thinking when is Dylan going to get into software? Because you see the trends and you see what the pain points and you see gaps in the market. Right. And what's not available when you're trying to, you know, do a site for a company. Um, sure. So talk about why did you why retention rocket out of probably a laundry list of other things that you could be doing? So I, I believe that retention marketing is broken as it is. Um, and I think that it's highly fragmented. There's a lot of different platforms that still don't play nice together. Um, and a lot of different people fighting over attribution. And uh, and a lot of the platforms are too complicated to integrate. So let's say you get a really killer ESP. 
And there's some great ones out there. Bronto is a killer platform. Klaviyo is a phenomenal platform. You've got some really cool platforms out there. Yeah. The For people who don't know, email service provider. Email service yes. provider. Yes. The challenge with a lot of these is that the platform is only as good as the implementation of the platform. Yeah. Right. So one thing that I've seen is that people will invest in best uh, best in class or best of breed technologies and they get frustrated with those platforms and the results they're getting, but they're not really executing well on that. And I don't think that's a habit that's going to change because people have now more than ever, people have so, to the same point of view of there's all these opportunities for me. There's all these opportunities for marketers, right? There's a hunt you on the app store. There's thousands of things they can be doing. Um, and so what I wanted to do was to build an omni-channel integrated platform that starts to look, machine learn around what types of preferences customers have in communication and then integrate as a hub with these various existing platforms that people have to predictively start to execute campaigns and uh, and reach out to people based on their kind of demographic, psychographic, and buying history. Um, that's one kind of component. The other component of the, it, that is that We've seen a big shift over the last few years where you had kind of the, the old school retail e-commerce and then all of a sudden platforms like Shopify and Big Commerce and these other ones come out and really truly democratize setting up an online store. Yeah. I mean, comparative to before, it's night and day, right? And so what's happened is that Yeah, and it looks same, and it looks pretty. Like you you know, you, you know, could you could have a Shopify store you know, people, I, I've heard you talk about this, like, you know, there's obviously WooCommerce and all these things, which is not a self-hosted platform, which has its issues. Um, but, you know, out of the gate in like a day or two, at least get something up that doesn't look horrendous that you don't have to host yourself. 100%. And, and literally within a day or two. I've built Shopify stores myself in a day just to kind of mess around and see what I could do. Um, so... So that became a thing. And then when that happened, you saw an influx of advertising on platforms like Instagram and Facebook and Pinterest and all these other ones, right? Not just because of these legacy retailers that are doing it, but all these guys jumped in. Well, when you were doing this three, four years ago and starting up, when guys like Movement were doing it, these guys were trailblazers, of this, right? But so many people saw success from brands like that, that they're jumping in to do their own thing. And the barriers are so low and the minimums are so low that it's flooded uh, these advertising platforms and the CPMs have gone up tremendously. And that's created a situation where it's actually very, very difficult to um, have a profitable first interaction yeah. with the customer. The customer acquisition is much higher because all these people are jumping on and driving up the, the ad cost type of thing. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so, um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that it's more important than ever that you're retaining your customers and demonstrating lifetime yeah. value. Lifetime you, value, yeah. So I thought to myself, okay, I want to be in the retention world. Um, I don't want to cannibalize or do what existing platforms are doing. There's already too many great platforms, some of the ones I mentioned. But how can I make it easier for these entrepreneurs um, to execute these retention campaigns with minimal time or capital investment, right? And the other thing about it was I, I, I started with an MVP that I won't totally go into right now because um, it's a beta, but I, to your point earlier about getting distracted about opportunities, one thing that I've learned to do is become highly focused on the things that I spend my time on. So that might be one or two things at a time that are the most important things that I want to use to drive success forward. And I think about that even with product, right? So with Retention Rocket, I've got a roadmap that's, a year long. I've got a phenomenal team, with all kinds of great ideas that are working on this. Um, but whatever we did first, I said the first feature needs to take minutes to set up and it needs to make you a shit ton of money the first day you set it up. Yeah. Because if you do that, no one's ever going to turn it off. Totally. Right? Um, so Give them a big win to start. What's, what's a big Give win out of the You're able to turn on your app, have little effort, and be like, where did all these sales come yeah. from? Right. The, kind of the example I see immediately, um, you know, um, is a lot of these charge uh, refund places, you know, for Amazon, right? You go on, you're like, oh my God, we just discovered like $40,000 of refunds that you belong, right? That's a quick win, right? They got you hooked right off the bat. And then how do you, how do you then from a product standpoint, 
prioritize going forward. And that's the hardest thing. It's something I think Shopify, by the way, has done excellent. Um, but it's really hard to prioritize and say, yes, I want these things. Yes, I believe my customers want these other things. They're telling me they want these things, but I have a vision of where this product is going. And some of that is gonna become a moot point. And the other ones are just not, sorry. The other ones are just not um, uh, gonna move the needle a month enough, right? So we have to really high, highly prioritize around the new features, even they're gonna demonstrate additional immediate impact. There's more, there's even more reason for this app blog post. Now that you know, now that you have your own app coming out, so yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, can, Go ahead. I don't know what you can talk about since it's in beta and you're releasing it. But um, the it's not easy for lifetime value to get them a quick win, right? So the, the next question is obviously how do you do that? But that may get technical, may not. But I think of a customer. Put it this way, the, a customer to me is someone that has initiated an intent by starting a checkout, right? And so it's not someone that just clicked an ad and went to your site, that's no, mm -hmm. not a customer, but it's at the point in which someone has entered their information and started a checkout, maybe they don't complete their purchase. Yeah. That is a, that is a customer that's, that's at the beginning of needing to be retained. Got it. So the digital beta feature is kind of around uh, uh, abandoned carts. Um, in a unique and novel way that that hasn't been highly executed on yet. Got it. That makes sense. Then um, the but, buyer intent. Put it on that you know may the average person's making a few thousand extra a day from day one, and we had one customer that's doing over a hundred thousand a day from wow. day one. With so pretty, with the help of with, retention rocket, you're saying directly attributable yeah. sales. Well, I think they'll pay for that app. Yes. Yes. Exactly. How do you decide what, what to charge then? Um, you know, because there's so much value there. Um, sure. You also want there to be value for the customer, value for your company, so you could sustain sustain it. How do you decide on uh, pricing? I think for me, um, you know, we kind of work with the customer early on, particularly when we're in a beta, right? Yeah. Like, what what kind of value is this bringing to you? Here's where we want to charge, but this is where you're at. We'll kind of work backwards if we're not quite there yet before we add in the other features. Um, but for me, the most important thing is getting the 50 to or 100 customers um, using the app uh, because that gives you a kind of a momentum where you can go out and, and explore the financial options that you want to to scale. Yeah. So we have Flow.io, Yapo, Nasto, Retention Rocket. What other yep. ones? Let's see what other ones are out there. Um, I think that there's a few around uh, returns that are really great. Loop returns is really phenomenal. Um, returns are an area where you have a lot of opportunity to scale back cost, right? Because it's a it's a frustrating experience. You can you can increase customer delight, yeah. and you can scale back kind of shrink on your revenue yeah. through bad return process. It can both go on both ends. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's beneficial. Um, and it's I don't know if I would call it an app, but on Shopify Plus. There's Flow, also called Flow, uh, not Flow.io, but it's it's their scripting or, or their kind of automation system. Mm -hmm. That goes back to what I said earlier. I think the future of software is automated. How do we take out the tedious tasks that don't bring value to the customer so that ultimately they're not putting pressure on your margin and you can give more value to your customer? Um, and so there's a lot of automation that's happening within Shopify uh, Flow, and I think that that's really, really cool. Um, and then there's the kind of table stakes things. You know, I don't know. There's going to be different levels of, of e-commerce entrepreneurs on here. I'm kind of thinking of some of the more advanced ones that we work with. But, you know, there's the table stake ones like any of the retargeting apps. I've heard people say great things about Shoelace when they're getting started up, right? That may not work for our clients, but for, you know, some of these smaller shops, that's probably a great option. Mm -hmm. um, maybe even something like Shopify's kit app. Again, maybe that doesn't scale with you if you're a, a large store, but if you're getting started out, how do you find the things? The biggest thing is find the things that are not going to take a lot of time involvement for you because time is... is that will is make so you the most money, yeah. Yeah, like immediate impact, reasonable cost, doesn't take a lot of servicing, um, I think is the key. So what about, I, know, I mean, I think Bold is one of the top Shopify I mean, apps. What, what are some of the ones that you recommend? What's that? Those guys are killing it. You know, I haven't I haven't personally had a lot of experience with the apps, but I do know that um, they're quite popular. I mean, they're the most popular app company on Shopify. 
Um, and I know that uh, I've heard people t look, a lot of people use bolds recurring orders and there's a few options for that, but it's certainly really popular. Um, bold just has such a variety that I think that they have a lot of unique things for different people in different use cases I might not even be thinking about because um, there's just so many, but um, love those guys, they're great. What about for subscriptions? Do you see, because I know it doesn't apply to everyone, right? Like watches, people aren't buying, they don't need to watch every month. But, but I mean, I know you guys deal with some beauty products and other things. What, what are the good subscription apps people should? The, the two most popular ones are uh, Bold, uh, Recurring, and uh, Recharge. Recharge, okay. Yeah, Recharge is pretty popular. All that being said, I don't believe there's any perfectly elegant solution on the market. Like it, it, it's you definitely, a, yeah, the big challenge is Shopify is not, not kind of really supporting tokenization in the way that it needs to. And, um, that becomes a big challenge. So, um, I suspect Shopify will solve for that. And that'll be an interesting thing to see. Does Shopify kind of encroach on those features by adding that natively? I don't know. I think Shopify mm. overall a phenomenal job of, of letting developers build upon it, but that's kind of a core core need. What have you seen? That, you know, that's a risk, right? Um, yeah. What have you seen where it basically puts them out of business? Because Shopify integrate. I mean, Facebook does the same thing, right? Someone builds some kind of something on top of it, and then like, yeah, that's a great feature. Let's just build it. They're a huge company. Um, what have you seen go away in the app store because Shopify has integrated that into their their native uh, platform? Okay. I, I don't know that I have a very, really good example, but I can tell you this. I would be more worried about obsolescence than Shopify copying something or adding it in, rather. Um, meaning that the problems that people are trying to solve now aren't necessarily trying to solve in a couple of years from now. What happens if three to five years from now, our web browsing experience is completely fundamentally different, which I, I believe it's heading towards, right? You know, the thing that Shopify does really smart is, and uniquely is that they more act as a system of record of commerce. And I think that's why they've dug, you know, nobody said this to me, but I, my opinion is that's probably why they've dug in deeply to so many different channels, right? Because any of these channels could go away, but, but they're kind of agnostic to the channel. But a lot of these apps and platforms are not agnostic. They're very specific. And so what I would be, what, what would keep me up at night as an app company are the way that consumers experiencing websites going to fundamentally change? And if so, how do I focus on apps that service that for the future and make sure that what I have right now is obsolete? How will it change? I mean, like besides the general people's like, yeah, it's gonna be more on mobile, right? How yeah. will how do you how do you think the it will change? Because that's also determining how you're probably designing sites and into well, you know. I think five to seven, five to eight years out, very few people, you also have to consider market. Okay, we're not talking about kind of emerging markets, but within the US or in technology kind of first countries. Um, I mean, the reality is that phones aren't that great, right? I think AR, VR, those types of things are probably pretty important in the future. I think that um, that's exactly why um, you know, Shopify is investing a lot in those areas, from what I've seen. Um, and probably more contextual um, ways that you can easily buy things in the context of now, i.e. you're out somewhere, you see something, you can buy it, ship to you by the time you get home, um, those kinds of things. Mm. Um, that, to me, is probably the future. And, and people might think that's kind of crazy, like, but, but as we've seen, the web experience is accelerating at a faster and faster rate. Um, every year, right? So I think the changes we're going to see over the next five to seven, ten years are going to be pretty profound. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I suspect that it's going to be very different. Yeah, I mean, you know, Dylan, we were talking before we hit record, and you were saying one of the things that's interesting is um, where e-commerce tech is going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is that what you're referring to, or, or something else? Well, kind of, yeah, definitely. But I think also, again. Look, to me, tech, the, the ultimate goal of technology is to get rid of anything from, from the moment that a maker makes a product 
sell the moment that a consumer consumes in whatever capacity that product. The ultimate goal of technology is to get rid of anything from point A to point B that creates inefficiency that doesn't bring value. to the So what does that mean? It means large marketing and large design and development. It means large customer service. It means um, layers and layers of kind of bureaucracy of minutia within organizations. It means automating your logistical processes. Things with Shopify flow, flow, right? So all these things, I think that you have these, these kind of hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs around the world are constantly looking at things now and saying, how can this be more efficient? How can this be easier? And I think if we look at Shopify, e-commerce, any of these platforms, their ultimate iteration, it should be that I make these candles in my bedroom and I don't know what the hell's going on with my website, but I sign up for this thing and it's running these marketing programs and it's getting me customers and I just ship them out, right? We're very far from it. But that is what things continue to move for, right? That's the ultimate kind of iteration of how this works. And it's really best for the customer. It's best for the customer because it's going to lower prices for people. And it's best for the customer because they get more selection around the products that they love. If it's a candle, instead of having one or two companies because they have the operational sophistication and distribution to get out there, got hundreds of different ones and the more that we break down the barriers of the technology the, the better value the more likely they're going to be satisfied with the product. yeah so you know we talked a little about some of the apps i don't know if there's any others that we should mention but um you also mentioned uh, email service providers yep what one i mean because i'm assuming clients come to your agency like okay just tell me what's best like what do you think or do they already come like, no, we're already using this and we're set on this? Mm -hmm. How does that conversation go? And then what do you usually recommend if they do go, you know, you're the experts, go for it. What do you think we should use? That's an interesting question. I, I think that, and not to give a softball answer at all, but I think that I would really dig into what are the use case, what are they trying to accomplish relative to the feature set of the platforms now, right? Also, what's their budget? So the, there may be something that one platform does uh, but it's substantially more expensive and you have to kind of look at that and say okay uh is um this feature or this thing or this opportunity worth the extra expense right for some people it's not for some people it is um the biggest thing i could say is if you are a larger enterprise with the budget think about the kind of available opportunities that you can do and find the platform that can do that and rapidly prioritize and execute on that so that if you invest in the more expensive platform you're getting return if you are really not ready to invest the time, energy, or resources into executing right, go for the less expensive platform, right? And it has to be something you have to think about in terms of your team. Do you have the appetite and operational sophistication, marketing capabilities to properly leverage? So it, I guess what I'm saying is there's a difference between the best platform uh, available and the best platform for the customer. So why would someone choose you, know, you mentioned Bronto, you mentioned Clavio. Why would someone choose one over the other? What would their, their pain points be? I think that... Um, I mean, there's many more out there, right? But Yeah, more out there. I think that, again, it's going to look into... Look, so Clavio is probably easier to get going. And Bronto probably has some features Clavio doesn't. Yeah. And can I name those off the top of my head? Probably not, but that's generally kind of, you know, the approach. Yeah. Um, Clavio can't be the ultimate iteration or solution for you for the long term, right? Because maybe you never have that appetite to improve those other things or you have other areas of opportunity to focus on. Um, I can tell you that Bronto is the most used email platform of the Internet 500. But, you know, what does that say these days? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so it's hard to it's hard to say. So I want to dig deep and we're going to talk acquisition, conversion, retention um, with some of the, uh, you know, the, the sites and the companies you've worked with, like Movement, Chubby's, Rebel, Barkthins. But as I, I'm really interested in why you decided to join the Navy. Oh, <laughs> well, I wasn't getting along with uh, my mom at the time and I didn't like her rules, so I decided to go to a place with much more rules. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. So, yeah. It was a poor uh, decision process. It was, it, was, it was bad. Why? 
it wasn't bad. It was just typical kind of, you know, or, or you mean with my mom or with the Navy? No, with the Navy. The Navy was great. I actually, I actually am really glad that I ended up joining. And I think probably um, I, I was a little wild when I was younger. Uh, and I think probably had I not joined the Navy, life could have ended up down a very different path. Um, uh, well, how old were you when you joined? I was 17 when I joined. You were 17. When I joined 18, when I shipped off to boot camp. Wow. But I, back before I, before I was even 18. What did your mom think at the time when you said, I'm going to the Navy? Well, I think she was probably pretty pleased. Because, she was. Yeah, because I didn't really have a lot of direction at the time. Um, I was never that interested in school. Uh, I thought it was really boring and, and had a hard time kind of focusing. Um, and didn't wasn't totally interested in college. Um, it just didn't, that kind of life path didn't seem exciting to me. Um, and so that being said, I knew I didn't want to just sit around, you know, Sacramento where I live. And so I joined the Navy and it was a great experience. And um, my first duty station, uh, I worked on the chief of Naval operations staff. Um, so I went straight from boot camp to, uh, to essentially uh, some training to essentially the Pentagon. Um, and worked there for a while. Um, and then, I uh, came to San Diego for a bit. So how do you think the Navy uh, changed you? A couple, one one really fundamental way. Yeah. And then a few ones. the most fundamental way was when I went to the Pentagon and worked there, I had a certain kind of expectation of what that would be like. And it was going to be very momentous and serious, let's call it. And being at the top, working directly with the top brass in the military, running the Navy directly under the president, it made me realize how normal they all were, right? So uh, they're just people who ended up moving up through a path and and um, found themselves in a certain place, like anybody through some hard work, some smarts, and a lot of luck. Yeah. And I think it kind of changed me forever um, and never again feeling either not good enough or nervous around anyone, no matter who they were. Mm. Because after that, it's like everybody's a normal person. Mm. Like if they could do it, I could do it too, type of thing. Um, the other things I think um, taught me a lot of patience. Uh, I'm not the most patient person, but but I would be even less so uh, then. Um, and, you know, there's certainly things that I did that made me more confident of other things that I could get through. Um, when there yeah, were what was the toughest part, toughest challenge you, you faced? Maybe it was, I don't um, know. There, there's like an a executional challenge and then kind of an emotional challenge, right? And the emotional challenge was when I went to the Middle East, it was uh, like a week to 10 days after September 11th. And so wow, we were really? in, Yeah. So we were in a high threat What condition. were you thinking at the time? Uh, I don't want to go? I mean, I feel like, don't send me a moth to a flame man like i see the i see the problems out there and i'm like i need to be there really you know it wasn't it wasn't necessarily like a uh a thing where i was worried i i, I actually got more excited and intrigued. i mean that's the most probably one of the most heightened senses in america yeah. at that time by the way not that there's any positive around anything that happened there so i don't want it to come across like that no, no. challenges of it definitely didn't deter me it it, it made it interesting um, but the, so you're the saying biggest, emotionally, emotionally, the biggest challenge was we got there and it was in a, um, it's called threat con Delta most of the time. And we weren't allowed to live on the base. We actually had to have apartments out in town because they were afraid the base is too small. If that base gets bombed, there's only 3000 people on it. We've got serious problems, wow. right? So everybody's spread out amongst buildings in town. Um, and no more than two Americans per building are allowed to be there. But at the same time, we didn't really have internet at that time out in town. So I, I couldn't like plug into a laptop and communicate. But after I would leave the base every day, I was forced to go directly home, sit there by myself for an apartment or in an apartment and then go directly back to the base the next day. So you can imagine after, you know, a year and a half plus two years of just sitting by yourself more than half the time. It, it, there's a certain uh, almost prison aspect to it. I would have rather lived on base. What do you do to occupy your time when you're... Read books. Um, and there was one American TV station that played the same show over and over called Briscoe County Junior. It was some like old Western show. I've never show. even heard of it. Yeah. I 
never heard of it either, but I definitely watched a lot of Briscoe County Jr. Um, read books and kind of daydream. What were you thinking internally? Um, were you were were you worried for your safety at all? I mean, you uh, I would imagine you stick out like a sore thumb as like a building. You're the only American soldier. Yeah. I think that um, I have a weird uh, problem with fearlessness where uh, probably sometimes when I should be more scared. I, uh, but generally speaking, I had I had pretty good confidence in the uh, team around me, the command, the leadership, what they were doing over there. Um, def- there were definitely some issues. There were, re- there were reports of um, sometimes some servicemen would be walking. There's no guns over there. So you didn't really have to worry about that. Like, there's no guns in the kingdom at all. It, that's a that's a huge issue there, or, or you know, a big thing there. So um, there were issues of people kind of walking across the street, people trying to run them over. Wow. Um, shortly after I left, there was a there was a um, restaurant that was really popular with with expats and Americans. Um, that a bunch of guys stormed it and then grabbed the forks and knives off the table and started attacking people. Um, so there were things of that nature, but they were more rare. Um, and, uh, not all the time. And actually I would say one of the biggest takeaways I had after leaving there was how much I didn't need to be afraid that people don't necessarily need to be afraid in other areas of the Middle East. Absolutely. But, you know, I was able to learn quickly that, that there's lots of, that there's many different people over there, including many loving people, um, who are really fantastic and particularly in the country I was in weren't we're more more uh, interested in us having commonality than division. Yeah. So you end your stint in the Navy after four years ish. Yep. What do you do next? So I went. Uh, I was actually thinking about becoming a Navy recruiter at that time. So I got out of the Navy, went back home to Sacramento, was looking into being a, a Navy Reserve recruiter. They took too long. So then I I headed off to college from Florida. Um, and uh, they called me on the way. They're like, we're ready for you now. And I'm like, I'm out. Sorry. So I went to college in Florida. Um, and then after like the first th- year there, I went home one day and or one day, went one uh, time and I was out at a party and I met this guy uh, who just like seemed to be living the dream. I didn't know what the hell he did, or what was going on. But whatever it was, I wanted it. Why? Uh, what, what did it What did it look like from the outside? Well, 23, and this guy had like a penthouse apartment and an Escalade, and he's having all these parties, and he's doing bottle service before people have heard of bottle service and, you know, all this kind of stuff. This is 2004, 2000, 2004, 2003. And so um, I was really intrigued. And I met him at a party. He said, hey, we're going to go back to my house. Would you have your party? You want to go? Yes, it was a great time. And then... Uh, I went on vacation with my dad to Australia and and within the first hour after I landed this guy called me and said I was like great this dude wants to party again yes Uh, because it was fun but this guy said hey I'm opening up a new branch of my company and I want to know if you want to join it Hmm. Um, I I think that you seem like you have a right personality for it I said great yes and that ended up being in the mortgage industry you didn't even know what it was you just said yes I just said yes. I was like, I don't know what exactly you do, but whatever it is, I want what you have, so I'm doing it. Um, and so that lasted for some time, a couple of years, and I had some good success in the mortgage world. Um, and I start, I had built my first website in like 1995. Hmm. Uh, and that was, uh, I had started a DJ company in high school. Really? Uh, yeah, it was called Capital City Disc Jockeys, and I was DJing all the kind of local. Uh, you know, Chad, that's his hobby, DJing. Oh, I know that. We'll have to. You'll uh, have to ask him about the silent disco that he okay. he ran as a DJ. I would love to. Uh, so you had a DJ company. He had a DJ company. No, you. Oh, I did. Yeah. So high school I had a DJ company, um, and started DJing for all the the kind of um, uh, school district and everything. And I think I was maybe like fifteen at the time or fourteen somewhere around. So there. you were entrepreneurial back then. I think I always just had a a drive to do something. I wanted to create something and do something. Um, but when I was there, I started realizing I was not satisfied with DJ and high school dances. Uh, and I used to subscribe to these mobile DJ magazine hmm. and all these other ones. 
talk about doing weddings and all this stuff. And I was like, man, that's where it's at. And I'm watching the news one night. And this co- also, by the way, I was grounded a lot in high school outside of going to DJ. Like I just was always in trouble and grounded and stuck at home. I don't know if my mom totally understood like what the I got very into the Internet because of that. Right. And this is in the, the early mid 90s. Yeah. Um, and I got very into the Internet because it was my outlet to the rest of the world. So I'm watching the so I, I'm pretty familiar at that point. And I'm watching this news cast and they're saying um, there's this new company called Google. And they're bringing customers to businesses through this thing called a search engine, because I had been just using directories and stuff at that time. Right. And this is where I need to be. Whatever this Google thing is. I. So I figured out how to register a domain name and I'm like 15 at the time. CC it's expensive at the time, right? How, how much were they? It was like 70 bucks or maybe it was 100 bucks, somewhere okay. around there. It was actually just more of an arduous process. Like, I didn't totally understand it. And you had to register it from two cows at the time. T-U-C-O-W-S. Um, They're probably still the, around, I think. They might be, yeah. yeah. And so I registered that domain. So what was the domain? TCDJ.com. TCDJ, okay. TC is Capital City Disc Jockeys. Um. And then I was like, okay, well, I don't have the software to build. Like, I needed Corel Draw and Photoshop and, and Dreamweaver and all that kind of stuff, right? And I'm like, wow, I don't really have the software to do this. So I broke into the school computer lab and took their disks and took them home and installed them and then went and put them back. <laughs> um, and then I just spent a bunch of time teaching myself HTML. At that time, there was no CSS. We were using, like, DHTML and stuff like that. Um, and taught myself how to use Corel Draw and Photoshop and made my website and got it in Google. And lo and behold, I started getting calls from people that wanted me to teach. The only challenge was once they got me on the phone and realized I was like 14, it was, it was a little challenging to close them on it. But that was my first kind of like, It was like a light bulb. Like you can drive people to your business using the internet. Yes. And I started collecting domain names in the early 2000s. Really? Yeah. Do you still have any? Probably, I don't even. Probably some. Probably You're like not. of a three-letter domain sitting somewhere. Yeah, I, I have a serious amount of domains. Yeah, so I did that. Um, so, anyways, going back to where that that led into, though. After that, I always had uh, a hobby around continuing to understand web develop. I'm not a great web developer now. I know just enough to be dangerous. Um, I can build a very basic site, but at the time, it was very advanced. Like it was blowing people's minds. Um, so I was always interested in that. And I got into the mortgage industry and it was going well, but then the mortgage bust hit. And um, I realized that this was actually the big opportunity because everybody else was used to doing things a certain way, cold calling leads, doing this or that, but people are still gonna buy houses, right? No matter what, even in a bad market, no matter what. In fact, what a lot of people don't realize was mortgages are what brought Bank of America back into profitability after the bus hmm. because it was so many refinances because the rates had to drop. So I started getting really into um, into uh, how can I do my own lead gen and, and use the internet to do this. And I got pretty successful with it. But I hated the job. I hated being in finance. I didn't like it. There was no creativity. I'm just dealing with people all day. So I thought to myself, well, I'm just going to become an internet expert. This is like a long time. This is like maybe 2006, 2007. I, I know that I know how to drive my own business in this highly competitive world of mortgages. I can definitely do it in other ones. So I had met uh, a guy at a wedding who was buddies with another guy who owned a big nightclub down in San Diego. And I thought, okay, let's start something small. Maybe I can ask him to introduce me to this guy and I can show him how to use the internet to get more nightclub bottle service bookings in his um in his nightclub so i went and i pitched the guy and he sits me down and says he said what's the internet no he knows the internet but he's like can you really do this and i said yeah he's like well i don't care about the nightclub let's like start a business doing this and he was like a highly connected he's actually one of my partners on retention rocket now Mm. guy that i really had a lot of respect for so i said all right let's do it we're starting a business he saw a bigger opportunity right away opportunity right away so he kind of started bringing in all his contacts and whatnot and we we ended up raising um i think two 
point two and a half million in venture capital um, and uh, also started an online shopping site had the agency going everything's humming um, and then we decided to shift all the resources to the online shopping site because it was blowing up um, and it, it was the most successful thing and the agency thing just didn't seem as exciting at the time so um, was this flank did. yes exactly exactly and then we had a site called cheap sally so cheap sally was the discount coupon saving site mm. so we did that and we reshifted things all towards that and everything was great that's growing and it's fantastic and then um one day we got hit with a google algorithm update from penguin and we had to close up shop almost immediately wow really yeah because we went from you know a lot of revenue per day to almost zero and we're just burning cash and the question is do we want to be walking dead and try to figure this out because we knew it was a pretty serious thing do we want to be walking dead or try to figure this out or do we want to take the remaining cash distribute it back to the investors and call it a day because we're not certain of the outcome of this um and that's what we ended up deciding to do my two partners in that ended up going on to found um a company called suja juice yeah love it that that was that's great. everywhere it's everywhere. those are your two partners those are my two partners oh yeah i love that stuff i buy it all the time at costco the big green juice yeah yeah, yeah. it's a great company great guys um and they ended up starting that and within i think three and a half years sold you know i think that it's it, like sold a, a large portion or a non-controlling portion of it at like a 350 million dollar valuation i believe company. it They're, it's amazing absolutely killed it and uh james went on james one of my partners went on to stand start also um kopari beauty which is another d to c beauty brand that's killing it my my wife actually um is their chief digital officer oh really uh, yeah i saw Q kopari beauty on uh the uh the work that you guys have done yeah yeah so they they've they've done tremendous things and james james um is partnered with me on the retention rocket platform as well um along with another guy named brian so they those guys started that platform or that that company and in the meantime um i after that first business shut down it was a really challenging period for me um because you know i hadn't made a bunch of money i had during the first period of that when we weren't getting, pay, getting paid i kind of spent through a lot of my money um and nonetheless one of the guys who was from the v, one, of, one of the guys that backed our company was a guy named Chris Birch, who started the Tory Birch company, and he's, you know, prolific investor involved in a lot of things. And his investments are ran by or were ran by a guy named Kyle Widrick. Um, and Kyle and I had always, you know, they kind of Kyle saw what happened there, and he realized that you know I was a pretty hard worker and really pushed it through. It didn't work out, but he said I really want to start another company with you. And I said okay, I, I'm open to it, but give me some time. And um, it was a few months later. Um, that he said, let's start an agency. And I said, absolutely not. I definitely <laughs> not want to start another agency. Last business I want to get into, don't want to do it. Um, so we're kind of fiddling along and, and seeing what's going to happen. And we got a phone call from somebody that knew us knew us both. And or they called Kyle and said, hey, are you still in touch with Dylan? And he said, yeah. And she said, do you know uh, if he still knows about like the internet stuff? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, okay, because I have this site that needs to get a bunch of Facebook fans and they need to do the advertising. And he calls me and he says, Dylan, uh, I've got this opportunity. Now's the time to start the agency. Let's do it. And I was like, absolutely not. He's like, come on. I said, dude, they would have to pay us an exorbitant amount of money for this work for me to even consider it because I definitely don't want to do it. Um, and he went back to him with the number and they said, okay. And so... <laughs> I was like, all right, well, I guess this is what we're doing. Um, so we did that. We kind of got that initial money in the account to start the agency. This was five years ago or so. Do you do all the work at the time or yeah. do you get other people to do it? The, oh, I was doing the work. You were? Yeah. Yeah. And for, especially in the first ones. I, in fact, I, I, had, um, I had moved to Charleston, South Carolina because my now wife said, Hey, I've been kind of sitting around waiting for you on this stuff you've been doing. It's time for you to follow me somewhere. Um, she was pretty, pretty uh, adamant about it. So she went to work for a really awesome e-commerce agency called Blue Acorn in Charleston. Um, and I tagged along. And uh, at the 
she had already had a place when I finally got out there. And I remember the first campaigns, I was literally in a, in a really crappy rented room because I was broke on like a blow up air mattress, like running these campaigns to like, you know, get it going. Make ends meet. Yeah. Make ends meet. That's yeah. the, that's the initial, um, look at the agency. So when do you hit the next major milestone? Cause obviously you guys have grown pretty quickly. The next major milestone was we, Kyle had a connection from uh, college who was a um, really successful uh, real estate uh, entrepreneur and private investor. And um, he talked to him and was able to secure a $250,000 angel round to start the agency. So we got that and we hired our first team members. Um, and it was, you know, somewhat good on some accounts and somewhat of a shit show on others when we first started <laughs> really trying to figure things out. Um, I have a and, question real quick. Um, yeah. It seems like you always had the mindset of growing quickly because some people may go on the mentality, well, we could bootstrap this. We can just keep building enough clients and then hire organically. But it seemed like with all of these, it's like, let's just go as quickly as humanly possible. Talk about the, the thought process for a second. Okay, bootstrapping versus let's raise $200,000 and start hiring people right away. So I think, I think first of all, it's, it's fine either way you want to go, right? You can bootstrap if you, but if you want to be big, I feel like you got to move really fast, particularly, hopefully if you're trying to go big, you're going into something that's new. That's a blue ocean opportunity, right? That's where I try to focus kind of my efforts. When we started this agency, we didn't at first, but quickly decided we are going to be a Shopify only agency. Why are we going to do that? Because this is the blue ocean. It's fast rising. I believed in the platform. I believe in their vision. I believe where they're going. And there is no leading agency in this space. There's no one that's the guys, right? And so for me, I move as fast as fucking possible to secure that status and to build that moat, right? Because I, I believe a few things. Number one, sales sales solves problems. You have no idea what deals are actually gonna fall out and close. You have no idea what clients are gonna churn. And when you're small, those are so impactful, right? If we look, I wanna keep all my clients and I wanna make them all happy, but inevitably there's just partnerships that don't work out. If that happens to us now, it's not that impactful. Nobody's getting fired. It's not impactful on the day to day of the business. It's a bummer, but it's okay because we have the scale to absorb those problems. A lot of these guys with you know, 10, 15, even 20, 30 person agencies, the challenge with that is everything is, is what's the word I'm looking for? Everything just is an outsized impact. You know, you lose a client, you better find another one really quick or you're letting go of people. And so for me, I thought number one, we need to secure the leading position within what we're doing. Number two is we need to get fast so that we can absorb the inevitable challenges that we're gonna face. Um, and number three is I think that momentum is just infectious. It's infectious with clients. It's infectious with partners. It's infectious with employees. When team members see a company growing really, really fast, they tend to focus on the direction of the company. When they're in a stagnant company, they tend to focus on themselves. Uh, and where they are within the opportunity of now, the people around them versus seeing the growth that's happening and saying, wow, this is going to keep going like this and I can be a, I can move up within this and be a part of this in a different way, if that makes sense. Totally. So who do you hire first? So you get this infusion of capital. Mm -hmm. How do you not, and you said it. For second hire. First hire was uh, uh, somebody to help with execution, I think. And the uh, second hire was a COO. So what was the next major milestone? So you get an influx of capital. Mm -hmm. Next major milestone was we got all the way down to 80 cents in the bank account. That's a milestone that you that don't want to hit. Yes. And in like 11 days from that, we had a payroll of let's call it 20 grand or 15, 20 grand. Um, maybe more than that, probably. And we were totally fucked but you know the number one thing that drove me through that to figure that out number one I had a phenomenal partner in our COO that we could really work well together and, and motivate each other but the biggest thing I think that was the um, motivator for me to solve that problem and figure it out 
was um, fear of embarrassment. Hmm. Because more than anything, honestly, because I had failed at the last startup. And I could say that there's these challenges and things that happen there. But if I fail at the second startup, then I'm definitely a loser. So in my head, at least. No right? pressure. Yeah. Pressures. And, and, and I didn't want to go to my friends and my family and my mom and my girlfriend and say, I failed at this. There was just no way. So I sat down and figured out what are the things that are really screwing our business right now. And I just went at it and our COO went at it and we rallied the team together and from that day forward we've been profitable. So how did you turn things around so quickly then? What did you do? What did you find that you needed to change? A couple of things was we stopped trying to take on every client. Mm. We worked with the people who were going to quickly move through the funnel that wanted what we had to offer and were willing to pay for it. That's an, I think a lot of people tend to waste a lot of time on, you know, people that are just kicking tires, right? And for me, it's nothing against that. That's fine if they want to do their research and do whatever, but I'm ready to work with people who are ready to get shit done now and are ready to make a decision now, right? And so cut out all the bullshit was number one. Number two was we stopped doing any type of fixed fee project and we properly scoped out all the potential hours of what things we're going to take. Hmm. And we started charging way more. And that's the funniest thing. The more we charged, the better we started doing in closing deals. Hmm. And at this time, we were twice, three times as much as all the other Shopify partners. But here's the reality. It actually costs to produce, like as an agency, we might make a 20% net margin at the end of the year, if we're lucky. That's a, that's a solid standard market. Uh, uh, number for an agency. When we explain to people, here's what here's what impacts the cost of your project. It's time, it's talent, and it's margin. That's it. Those are the three things that make up the price of a website. How much are we actually going to spend doing this? Time and effort. Uh, what level of talent are we getting? What do they cost? And what's our margin going to be? And we focused on those three things, and we told that to people. And we started saying, this is our margin. This is what it costs us to produce. This is the amount of time it actually takes. And this is why we believe it takes these, this level of talent at this time. And um, you, if you want to go with these other competitors, go for it. But you have to decide where you want to sacrifice. Do you want to sacrifice on the people working on your site? Or do you want to sacrifice on the effort that they put in? Either one's probably. And then you have to decide which one of those is going to give you the most predictable outcome. Right, because you're working with an agency, you're working with an agency so you can get a predictable outcome. Uh, otherwise, you would just do it in house. So you better damn well invest in the right people that are going to go to give you the most predictable outcome. And once we started explaining it like that to people and showing them the numbers, it was logical. And all of a sudden, we started closing these deals. And in fact, instead of looking at us like we were expensive, and that still happens sometimes, they would go home and realize and ask people, "Well, how are you coming in at this price?" What does it cost you per hour to service this with your employees? How many hours are you scoping? And are you sure these are really the hours to get the features that we want? Right? There's a favorite line I like from Drake, the rapper. He says, it's one thing, doing it right is a whole different story. And that's kind of where we started to go to. So we focus, and here's the, the other, one of the most important things that I cannot stress enough to people that are in the service industry. Do not work if you're not paid. Don't ever do it because you will get held hostage on your funds. It doesn't, it's not even that people are bad people. It's people are going to get away with what they can. When you get paid for something first, your client is so much more focused on knocking that out and getting it done versus getting started on a project and then getting paid on milestones. And then they drag it out forever. Right? So it was charge properly, scope properly, find the right people and get paid up front. All of a sudden, we don't have cash flow issues, right? In the agency world, it's very much a cash flow business. But now we don't have cash flow issues. Now we can take that money we're making and invest it into even better talent, right? And I think that we started investing in high-level talent way ahead of some of our competitors in Shopify. And, the, and I think that's demonstrable by going on LinkedIn and looking at you know the people that are there. 
And there's some really great talent at all these guys now, right? But kind of before they were willing to make that, I'm big on making bets for what I believe in, right? And I'm not scared. So to me, it was like, I know I need the best talent in this ecosystem. I better charge to get it. And I better start investing that money immediately, not into myself and not into bullshit, but into more talent. And that was one of the toughest things because for the first over two years of BBA, I didn't take a paycheck. I was, there was, there were literally, when we were at 20 plus people, there was a period of three months where I was sleeping underneath my desk at night in a sleeping bag and hiding it in the closet in the morning when the employees would come in and was getting Subway sandwich coupons to eat those and showering at 24 hour fitness a couple blocks away. Right? And you were just was, relentless in making sure this all worked. A hundred, because there is no option for failure. And this is what's funny when I, when I, you know, you've probably seen some of my LinkedIn posts where people get all fired up when I talk about working hard or putting all of yourself into something. And, yeah. and you know, had, had I had a job on the side while I was trying to do this, it would have never happened, right? But it took, I think there's something about, at least for me, there's something about putting yourself in a situation where failing is dire that helps you to perform to a level you never would have if you didn't have that pressure. Yeah. That's where you a lot of, of businesses that get overfunded and they raise too much money and then they fail because they lose their scrappiness, you know, and they didn't, they didn't go through Like for me, I am so, uh, uh, I like to invest in fun and things for the employees and whatnot, but I'm ruthless in like, where are we spending our money as a business? Because I've been through those periods and I've seen what it looks like when you lo when you get rid of your cash. Thank Even you. back, you know, Dylan, there was an article in 2011 um, where you were interviewed and the theme that I saw even at that time was staying hungry. Yes. That always seemed to be a theme for you. Yeah, absolutely. Because here's the way I look at it. When I literally believe right now with BBXL, there's a ton of people that I'm really cool with in the ecosystem that I love that are great. But I know every day when they go home, they would love to put me out of business. And it's not a personal thing. It's not, <laughs> they would love all of my clients and they would love to have all of them. And it's not personal and I love them nonetheless, right? But I know mm. that there's two, look, there's, there's, you know, you can be smart, you can be lucky and you can work hard. And there's only one of those things that you can, uh, that you can uh, control. Yeah. I remember I was interviewing, I don't know um, if you've, heard or listened to any of the books of Mark Devine, who's a Navy SEAL who started uh, several businesses, one of them SEAL Fit, where he runs people through a Navy SEAL Hell Week for civilians. Um, and he, I remember when we talked, he said, uh, I think it was him who said, Jeremy, you know, I'm training when I'm thinking about training. I know there's a guy in a cave somewhere training to kill me or we're going to meet someday. Exactly. It. That's it. And it's yeah. funny because People don't want that to be the world. Like when I when I get in conversations with people and they're like, that's not what life is about. I'm like, great. It's not about that for you and that's fine. But you have to recognize the consequences of not applying yourself is to be average at that thing. It doesn't mean you're average in your life. It doesn't mean that you're average at being a father. It doesn't mean you're average at anything else. But the consequence of not applying yourself in the professional world is a lack of success. And that is the consequence. Unless somebody else got, or unless you got really lucky, or you're just so much smarter than everybody else, but that's harder and harder to be, right? So that's the reality of it, and at least that's the way that I see it. How so do you stay I, hungry now, though? You know, back in that day when you're under the desk, you know, in a sleeping bag, it's it's um, that is really a driving force, right? You're driving away from pain. How do you keep that now, as you grow, as you've grown? Oh, because I can't, I can't stand to not, I, I hate losing more than I like to win. Honestly, it really, it really is dry. Like the fear of someone else overtaking me as something that I'm like, when I do something, I want to be the best in the fucking world at it. I really do. Like, why am I doing this? If I'm not the best in the world at it, why would I even spend, if I'm going to work this hard, I better be the fucking best in the world. At it. And if I'm not yet, I better keep trying. And so for me, um, have to be number one. Like when I, I tell, I tell when I talk with with clients or I talk to people, you have to go in your market. You have to be as 
you know, the age old kind of GE philosophy of you got to be number one or number two in your market. And if you're not, get the fuck out and find something you can be number one at. Um, and that's how I approach things. And I know that somebody's trying to take that from me every day. So talk about the decision to acquire Rocket Cut. So I think there's a couple of key things. Number one is we, if you looked at who we competed against, who was most similar to us in the ecosystem, that's Rocket Cut. Yeah. I think number one. I remember talking to um, Jonathan at IRCE thinking, this guy's impressive. Like he knows what he's doing. Their company is, is an impressive company. Mm -hmm. It's a very impressive company and they have some killer or or had some killer talent there that we were excited about. I think opening ourselves up to that Columbus market, um, opening ourselves up to, um, the business that's there. A lot of people don't realize Columbus is the number one retail city in the United States outside of New York. Didn't know that. Uh, you got headquarters of Express, Abercrombie, American Eagle, all these really large retail brands. p and is just up the road in Cincinnati. So there's actually a huge amount of retail brands out there. Having a presence is really, really valuable for us. We do a fair amount of work with P&G. So um, that's, that's helpful to be that close. Um, I think that I have a way of looking at things and John has a way of looking at things and us looking at those things together is a sum greater than the parts. Um, and uh also i like the people so these things kind of all came together and the other question was you know where can we add value to them i think that you know by just sheer virtue of our size and where we got to we had solved maybe a lot of the operational issues that that they still had and were working towards um and so there's also the opportunity where by bringing them in the fold we bring more value to them yeah. than to ourselves as well um and those were kind of the genesis. And the other thing is, is, you know, you mentioned I've got, I've got retention rocket. I've got a few different things going on. One of the ways that, that I'm able to stay focused is, you'll you'll see that within the different businesses that I start, um, that are outside of it, that they always have their own leadership teams that are running it day to day, right? And that helps even with John within BBA. So as I'm moving towards, you know, other things. Um, John is able to be there day to day along with Annie, our COO, and really execute there as well. So I think it was just all, all the signs pointed to it's a great opportunity. How did those Dylan initial conversations go? Because I could see, oh, you approach them to acquire them. You know, people have to open their books. They're like, well, this is a competitor of ours, right? Yeah. So are they serious? Are they not? We're, we have to open our books to these people, and they're going to see everything that we're doing. I mean, was it initially, you know, kind of like, I don't know, I kind of picture like a first date. You ask, you know, it's like, no, I don't know what the initial response was, you know, that initial conversation. Maybe like, no, not interested. Or how did that, the initial conversations progress? So um, we first, you know, I think it was like 20, what year is it? 2018? 2018. I think it was, 20, <laughs> I think it was 2015 that, um, I hit up all the owners of the other top kind of Shopify agencies at the time. I said, hey, we should get to know each other. Let's go down to Austin and rent like a big Airbnb and I'll just like hang out and get to know each other. And it was fantastic. And we did six six or seven agencies there. Um, And Shopify set us up with this awesome night at Topgolf and it was really great. But that's where we really first kind of got to know each other, right? And then over, uh, uh, over time, you know, John had some clients in San Diego. Uh, and so he had come out to visit a few times with those clients. And each time that he did, we would go grab dinner. We would chat about stuff. And and we always found that, like, we always had fun conversations. Yeah. We could talk along. We were both very passionate about each other. It's an interesting dynamic, Dylan. You know, you're friendly, but you're probably going head-to-head on certain projects also. Yeah, for sure. For sure, definitely. Um, and... Uh, that being said, I think John, I can't remember who who approached you first, but then we were at Unite last year, maybe or the year before, and we said, "Hey, um, this is looking more and more like we could really kind of accelerate together." No pun intended. Right. Um, and uh, it just got the conversation started. And trust me, it took a while. It is hard to get two groups to agree on all the terms of a deal. And it was funny because po- a lot harder than people think. And it was post that that I had other people hit me up in the ecosystem being like, 
oh, we're probably going to see a bunch of people doing the same thing now. I'm like, we'll see. I haven't seen any of them yet because there's a lot involved and there's a lot on both sides where you have to let egos go. There's a lot where you have to have a lot of trust in the books and things of that nature. And then there's the, the realities of trying to deal with what does the cap table look like post that, right? Who, who gets what share of the combined business? And you have to kind of really agree on that all together. And, you know, we had myself, we have Kyle, my partner. Because everyone partner. thinks their baby is worth, you know, a lot. Is, one thing that I, th- I find is, you know, also going back to, to that uh, question of what keeps me going. One thing that I found, look, when we were six people and then we got to 30 people, I thought we were the shit. And then 30 to 60 and I thought we were the shit. And then we were thir- 60 to 90 and then I'm like, oh my God, we're killing it, right? It wasn't until, but that's because I had the context of what was around me at the time. It wasn't until like now we've hit like 120, 130 plus, whatever the number is, that then I start to look around and see that, you know, overall my competitors are no longer who my competitors were necessarily. Mm. And the companies that I'm competing against now, I'm now the small fish again. Mm. Right? So when we look at- kind of like- I picture like Conor McGregor or something, right? Or someone in a weight class, and they go to the next weight class, and they go to the next weight class, and they go to the next weight class. It's a whole different top dog. Right. And it gives you a lot of um, lives, gives you a lot of self awareness um, and, and humility. I, I don't think anybody would accuse me of being humble per se, but uh, it does give you a lot of humility in that. You have humble um, beginnings, though. Humble beginnings for sure. It gives it gives. Um, very humble gettings, by the way. My parents were dead poor growing up. Uh, single mom, three jobs. Wow. Just, what did know, she did. do? And that was always a drive, too, because my parents always said, even from a young age, my dad told me we'd be driving through San Francisco and I'd go visit them and we'd pass by some big houses and I'd be like seven years old. And I'd tell them, I'm going to own those one day. Like, mm. that's for whatever reason, I was always driven that way. But, um, Anyways, it's just the bigger you get, you start to realize that there's a lot more out there than you than you saw before. Uh, but then that gets exciting because now I can look at those guys and see, I hope you underestimate me too because I'm coming for you and I'm taking everything. Do you think that's where some of that drive comes from, from coming from that the humble beginnings? Certainly so. I mean, that's just been our family. What did your mom do? You said she had three jobs at once. Yeah, growing up, I mean, uh, working at Walgreens in the checkout, working – night shifts at the IRS as a computer programmer and then working some other job too. Yeah. She so it sounded like she was doing whatever it took to put food on the table. You have to understand my family, my great, her father, my grandfather was a founding member of Delta force. If you ever heard of it, that's not just like some, you know, a lot of people say those kind of things, but it's actually true. Like he's in a book, they've talked about it. The guy was, and is still, I mean, he, he's like 80 something years old. He would definitely kick my ass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that, my my mom and my aunts, they grew up in a world, you know, where my grandfather, uh, my grandfather went to Vietnam, three tours of Vietnam, special forces, and my grandmother was out of the picture. She was no longer there. My parents, or my mom and my aunts had to go live in foster care wow. for a long time while their dad was out. They had to go through a lot of really challenging stuff. And when they were at home, there were no excuses on anything, right? And so... I would say growing up, uh, my mom was a great mom, but very, very high expectations and zero room for excuses on anything ever. Excuses were just not tolerated. Yeah, it's it's amazing, actually. It's probably you saw what she was doing, and I, I imagine your work, some of your work ethic comes from that, you know, sure. seeing that. Sure. Um, so... Dylan, I want to shift for a second, um, thanks for sharing that by the way, to acquisition, conversion, retention. Okay. And I wonder if we take a look at one of the, I know we were talking a little bit about, you know, there's retail driving online or, you know, which is the Bark Fins and, and the Rebel. Um, and then there's the movement, which is a lot, you know, e-commerce. Um, let's talk about movement for a second. Or you mentioned Rebecca Minkoff uh, site. That's what, a great one. Favorite. Those guys there are some of my favorite people I've ever met. So I'm happy to talk about them. Which one? 
Oh, Jake and Kramer and Alicia and the whole that movement. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love the people at Rebecca Minkoff too. They're great. But but Jake and Jake and Kramer who started movement um, are just first of all two very special, hardworking guys that are similar mindsets, which I can really appreciate. And I just think that they they did such a phenomenal job taking their product to market, scaling the challenges as they did so. Um, and growing, you know, bootstrap. Talk about guys that bootstrapped it. They bootstrapped it to ninety million dollars a year. It's amazing. In in a few years, that's crazy. And when we first started working together, you know, I drove my motorcycle up from here to to L.A. to meet with them and talk about how we could work together. And it was the meeting was at their apartment in their bedroom, you know, and they're sitting there chatting with people on their website about watches, and they're doing okay, a couple hundred grand a month. But you know, to see those guys go from that to where they're at now is just really inspiring. So let's talk about their site for a second. Some of the uh, components of acquisition, conversion, retention. I notice when I go to the site, um, there's this nice looking iPhone or mobile device that follows me around, which makes me, uh, which which narrows my choices as a consumer. You know, when I when I go to it, I can be overwhelmed with. Mm -hmm seeing all the watches, but that thing keeps following me around. It seems like it like, it's almost like going to a small college or something where there's large colleges it, and it gives me a, a more customized experience. So I don't know, talk about some of the thought process that went behind this site with, you know, maybe acquisition pieces, conversion pieces and retention pieces. Sure. So I think for us, you know, we've worked with movement on helping them with their affiliate program on the acquisition side. But I will say from an acquisition side, they have, there's a guy named Ryan that's their CMO. He's built a phenomenal team. He's a really, really, really sharp guy um, that came from a, a very large media buying background. And he runs their acquisition in-house. And they've got a team of buyers. They've got their own studio in there where they can uh, uh, you know, create their own content. I mean, these guys are really on it. On the conversion side, I would say is really where we um, have the biggest um, help and impact with them. Um, and, uh, what we've really done there is look, we've been working together three and a half, four years, maybe somewhere along that. Um, and the thing about websites is they're never really done. There's always things you can improve and there's hypothesis around those things, right? Always testing. Always yeah. testing. And particularly if you're doing things right, it takes an exceptionally long time, years to get through because you're get, you're waiting for statistical significance. You're constantly, even when you get a win, you're constantly saying, okay, how can we get a bigger win, right? It's not just what's my conversion rate, but then how can we increase average order value? That's another thing, right? So, you know, as an example of a test we ran that made big impact, we tried out a variety of ways to do strap up sales, mm. right? So, hey, great, we're gonna buy this initial watch, but we should be selling them on additional straps with yeah. that watch you know, they got a nice lift in average order value from that. And those are the types of things we're constantly doing and iterating with. I would say the biggest thing that's been a driver of success is the closeness in which the teams work. Uh, so BBA, we've tried to structure teams so that they truly become extension. So at a lot of agencies, you have a client, they push through a task that they need done, it gets assigned out to a designer or a developer, it comes back, you deliver, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's one way to approach it. For us, we set things up in smaller agile teams, wherein um, there might be a designer, a few developers. Like a scrum methodology type of. Line it to that, and then developing this nice backlog and roadmap, and then prioritizing ideas based on level of effort, potential impact, confidence of impact, and, uh, and adjusting those things and continually reevaluating, right? So like, oh, we have, that's where I said earlier, like there's a lot of ideas that you can have, but we've got this idea over here and a hundred other different ones. Well, or what usually happens, and I'm sure you've heard the say, saying is hippo syndrome, highest paid person's opinion, usually gets to decide where it's going. But we, we, we wanna really look through things methodically and say, what is, out of all the opportunities, what's actually gonna drive the most impact? What do we have the confidence of? And by the way, what is the level of effort of these things? Sometimes people will get so obsessed on an idea saying, this this thing will impact conversions by X. We feel so strongly about it. But you look at it and the level of effort is like crazy. You know, maybe it's some super crazy product customizer or something that, right. you know, a half percent of people ever 
are going to ever use and you've just spent all this money on. So we try to like balance those things and see that. And, and with that agile team methodology, our team can work really closely with their team in perpetuity, right? So you've got the same people working for months and years on yeah. site and develop a strong understanding of it. And I think that's... Yeah. And it speeds the process that that gets things done because if they already know it, they're not trying to onboard new people and familiarize them with the product and the site and what's been done. So you can get you can get on it different projects probably yep. very with much speed. So what do you do? How do you help like a watch company with retention? So what we try to think about is. Let me give you an example of retention that people might think not think of and what how it goes with conversion. So yeah. let's let me give you an example of Copari, if you don't mind. Yeah. So you've got someone that bought think about Nosco even from a retention standpoint. Retention is is equally about you leveraging previous data to show people more things that they'll want to buy and not just getting them to buy the same thing again. And I think a lot of people don't think about that in that context, right? So from a retention standpoint, it might be leveraging both on Copari and movement, a dynamic yield, uh, dynamic yields, a, a, a optimization platform that we use that does predictive kind of uh, merchandising and whatnot or optimizations. So maybe we want to look at what's their previous buying history and merchandise the site with the thing that's most likely to be the next thing they would want. So that not only, but we're leveraging that previous customer data, right? So not only are they kind of converting, we're helping them retain that customer. Uh, by doing that. The other things we do are uh, outbound kind of retargeting campaigns that are based, and we don't do that with, with movement because they do that in-house, but outbound retargeting campaigns that are designed to bring people back and get them to purchase again, right? Things of that nature. What we don't do, we don't do the traditional email marketing and things of that nature. Um, but what we do is try to say, when people come back, how are we getting them to buy again? How do we show them something new and interesting based on what they bought before? Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. So from the, the it sounds like movement, um, the conversion and retention are big. They, uh, you do some acquisition stuff, but they have a lot of in-house team. Um, yep. And it sounds like with Kalpari, you do do some acquisition stuff. You help them with acquisition and conversion and retention. Talk about that. What um, will be the best example for from an acquisition standpoint or from the sites? Sure. You help? So... From Copari or from just like as an example, one of our clients for for acquisition is Mizzen and Main. And so we worked with Mizzen and Main for a long time, helping them to uh, acquire new people. People love their stuff. Love their too. So good the product <laughs> is so. Good. Um, and uh, we've ran advertising for them to help them acquire new customers. Right. I guess the thing is the thing that we try to do is say, here's our suite of what we do. Right. And there's some clients, even ones I'm not. We have 150 clients now, so I'm not totally as in the weeds on them all as I used to be. But overall, the way that we look at that is we look and say, um, what's your overall capabilities internally? Yeah. And how can we augment that in an a la carte way to help you get the full kind of suite of, of things you need to execute upon? So some of them will be affiliate and web design and development. Some of them will be just media buying. Some will be... See, I would imagine, Dylan, people come to you and they don't even realize you do this stuff. They have this vision of what you do, which is different from what you actually do. Sure. And then when they approach you, then they probably are like, "What? you do all that, right? Yep. So what kind yep. of stuff do you do under the acquisition, the conversion, and the retention? Okay. Acquisition. We run affiliate marketing campaigns. We run paid social campaigns run paid search campaigns um, and we actually have a team now that's focused on acquiring customers on Amazon uh, because that's that's a uh, table stakes now um, on conversion we're doing personalization we're doing uh, data driven web design and development um, and we're doing uh, kind of road mapping and priorities and, and, and strategy from that standpoint from the retention standpoint it's more about how can we at with Copari, how can we work with uh, outside of the things I talked about, like specialized retargeting and merchandising on a site for retention? How can we also work closely with their email service provider? So Copari works with email aptitude. So how can we work with email aptitude to make sure that their retention email or, or the product there is in line with what the, the merchandising experience is on the site when they click through from that email, 
right? But we look at it and say, those are the three pillars of things. We have a multitude of services within them, but we want to work with you holistically and strategically, even if you're executing some portions of that, to make sure that it's integrated across those things. The more that you can be integrated and personalized across those, I think, the better. Who's a good um, client for you? Like, I'm thinking maybe someone's like, well, maybe I'm too small for BVXL because they do bigger brands. What's the kind of the entry point where it makes sense for them to engage you in one of these aspects or all of them? I would say, you know, at the very low end, eight to 10,000 a month on a retainer fee. Um, on the high end, we have people paying 50,000, 60,000 a month. So it, it, it really varies. But eight to 10,000 a month, typically our clients are fast growth companies doing a couple million dollars a year. So they've grown really fast and they just want to accelerate on it. Um, or they're larger companies who have substantial revenues that want to continue to further increase them, right? Typically a couple million a year or well-funded. We've worked with a lot of people who were D to C brands who went out and raised a bunch of money and then they're able to come work with us. Um, and really that, again, it goes back to those things I was talking about, which is, you know, we made it, we are not the best agency for everyone. We made a decision that we wanted to have the best talent and that's not cheap. Um, we wanted to put in the right amount of effort and we want to find people that want to invest in really doing those things right. And that doesn't mean that a different approach is wrong, but if you do think that approach is right, we want to do it right. We don't want to dip our toe in. Does that make sense? Totally. Other things that make a, a great client for me are um, pays their bills on time. Uh, um, that's critical. Uh, I know it sounds silly almost, but seriously, I don't think people realize the impact that paying your vendors on time creates in your relationship. Because when you're a great client that's paying your bills on time, everybody notices that, sees that, it doesn't put stress on the team where they're having to go to bat for you and say, let's keep working for them, or, you know what I mean? So pay your bills on time. And then the third thing is um, that they, eat, they have to work within our process. So one of the things that I think has allowed BBXL to scale, uh, it has been critical to it, is that we have a really um, defined project management and account strategy process that we go through. And where we find challenges is when people refuse to go through the process. They want to be special. They want to have their own things. What people don't realize is that when you don't go through the process, you create a ton of extra inefficiency in your project. It causes overburns. It causes you to not get the things that you want out of it. It causes frustrations on the part of the teams. And so we've had to fire clients because they're not able to follow the process. Who should be using you? That's not like, as you, like you said, kind of going to the next level. Yeah. And now I don't know if the term punching above your weight class really holds true, but you're a smaller fish, right? Mm -hmm. Who, who's in that tier that should be using you? The funny thing though, FYI is those fish are now trying to jump on the Shopify plus spawn, right? But the interesting thing about that is that we've now developed the pedigree within that. So even when we compete against a lot of those guys, we still win the project. You have an expertise there we have the expertise and these guys are trying to learn in these people's dimes and yes they're a great successful agency that's deployed magento and demandware instances successfully but a lot of them really struggle with shopify and they struggle for a couple reasons number one it's a completely different architecture and system and way of doing things right so not only is there a different coding language but it's a whole different logic kind of around how you do things and that's challenging we've done it so many times with so many large use cases that we are the we are the best choice for a large enterprise brand migrating to Shopify. Hands down, I believe. Um, I think that's why we win most of those contracts. We, we have the most experience, not the most amount of time. We're going to get the most predictions. I think that the people that should be using me and aren't are, are really along the same lines of the people that are using Gento and should be using Shopify Plus. If you are a large brand, and you are spending most of your monthly retainer on maintenance and not growing revenues, and you don't have some kind of crazy use case of international B2B with some, you know, when I, I could look down the list of demandware clients and uh, Magento clients, and I can see so many people that would be saving hundreds of thousands of dollars a year on their Shopify store versus their Magento or demandware or something like Magento Enterprise. It's so much money. 
on so why is it stopping them is it just a fear of unknown different things number one is that a lot of people at these larger companies have moved up within a culture that has had to solve a different problem like i was saying earlier traditional retail enterprise because you didn't have these platforms like shopify was about a high fixed cost building an investment and leveraging that to build a moat so you're going to go in and you're going to say I want to build the most custom, awesome. Here's what I think, and here's what I think is going to be the best, and I have to do it this way because if I get this wrong, I'm fucked, right? Because uh, it's too expensive to change it, right? And there's this mindset that that's the way you have to do these really expensive builds. It's just starting yeah. to shift, but that's a cultural thing where people came up from. Yeah. From the, in, a, in addition to that, you've got a ton of legacy Magento and Demandware agencies that are scared shitless about the proliferation of Shopify and what that means to their business. Even the ones that are partnering and are out there, I know that they're scared of it because here's the problem. A Shopify build, even at the expensive end of our side, is substantially less expensive than a demand work. Let me give you an example. We had a build that we did that was about 250,000 on Shopify Plus. So they had, and their retainer is, you know, $3,000 or $30,000 a month, let's call it. They're, and that's all going into actually impacting the front end and making demonstrable changes and revenue cha and, and experience, right? Their last build on Magento Enterprise was a million dollars and they were paying a $70,000 a month retainer. Wow. They're getting more work product for a fraction of the cost from us at a faster speed where they're able to try out new things much faster because they integrate so efficiently at a fraction of the cost. And they can take that cost and they can put it into acquiring customers. Love it, Dylan. Dylan, first of all, I just want to thank you. This has been fantastic. And I can talk to you all day. When you said, oh, we have dinner at 7, I would take you up on that. And we would just talk and break down every single site that you've worked on. <laughs> and, and the acquisition, conversion, retention, because I love this stuff. And I love talking to you. And I have so many questions about you know, shifting from Shopify to Shopify Plus, you know, Magento to Shopify, mistakes, luck, hiring, all this stuff. But... I'm going to let you relax because you just got married and <laughs> um, I just want to end with, first of all, people should check out BVXL, B-V-A-C-C-E-L.com. They have an active blog. You can see what they've done. They've done some amazing work um, and it's all about, you know, affecting the bottom line essentially. And um, so I always ask with Inspired Insider, what's been the low point and then on the flip side, what's been a proud moment for you? Because we've heard this crazy up and down roller coaster mm -hmm. journey. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the low point was uh, uh, definitely, uh, you know, the Subway sandwiches and sleeping under my desk was. Uh, and when we were down to that 80 cents and it was like a choice of this is fucking happening and there's no one else in the world that's doing it but me. So I got to figure it out. Or I'm done and I'm about to have to tell my friends and family in a couple weeks that I'm a loser and also owe a bunch of people payroll that, you know, aren't going to get paid. And that's my reputation. That was that was the lowest point, probably. Um, the it's funny. I don't know if it's the highest point, but it's a, a particular moment that stood out to me um, as something that was like just such an excitement for me. But, you know, when we land big clients now, I still get excited. I'm always excited. Like, I love it, right? But landing your first big client is, you're elated. And I remember we had been pitching a deal for uh, Red Bull to build their Shopify store. And this is one of our first early stores. And we'd been pitching it for a couple months, and I wanted it so bad, so bad. Uh, by the way, we were pitching against John Poma. Um, oh, really? <laughs> Yeah, I knew he wanted. If you if you can't beat him, buy him. No. <laughs> but we, I, uh, I remember I went to go get a slice of pizza, and I walked downstairs, and I got about halfway to the pizza place, and I got a call from the gal at Red Bull that said, "Hey, we're ready to move forward." And I, and by the way, this was right around the time when we had serious economic challenges, right? And that was one of the deals that helped us really get through that. Um, and I remember running back to the office as fast. We only had like eight employees then or something like that. But I remember 
running back to the office as fast as I can and opening the door and be like, we got Red Bull. And I was so pumped. And that that's a hard moment to recreate because even though we've gotten more substantial visible projects now that are much bigger and that was a, a relatively small project. It was project, the timing though. The timing, it was the timing and it was like, shit, a real brand that could work with whoever they want has decided to pay us money to help them. Like, we're on to something. Like, we're doing this. We're on to something. And that was a big confidence boost. Yeah. Well, congrats, Dylan. Everyone check out bvxl.com and uh, check them out. Thank you. Thanks. Have a good one. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find this.